Welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I am Dominic Chu, filling in for Bob Pisani today. China investors are facing no shortage of headaches these days. Chinese tech giants were rocked by a bevy of bad news just last week. Primarily, a massive liquidation by hedge fund Archegos Capital, but also concerns over rising regulatory risk right here in the United States. The Crane Shares CSI China Internet ETF, that ticker KWEB, KWEB as it's known, took a serious beating, falling nearly 12% in just one week. Chinese regulators have also been turning up the heat. They stunned investors in November by nixing Ant Group's IPO at the very last minute, and officials have repeatedly expressed concerns about inflated stock prices and excessive leverage in the financial system. So, what kind of impact should we expect on Chinese ETFs from all of this? Let's ask Brennan Ahern, CIO of Crane Shares. He runs that KWEB, KWEB as it's known. Also, also with us today is Tom Lydon, the CEO of ETF Trends, and Dave Mazza, head of product over at Direction Investments. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for being here. I would like to start with Brendan, if possible, because your ETF is possibly tracking the epicenter of a lot of this last week's moves. What exactly can you tell us about what's happening with these Chinese Internet names, and how is it translating into your ETF? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Dom. Um, I mean, I think we are in a uh, bit of a rotation from the growth orientation, the work-from-home stocks, to a little bit of more of a balanced um, balanced exposure where you're seeing some of the uh, the reopening trades some of the cyclical value stocks come back and i think I think you know you you have an element of some of these regulatory concerns u s China you know this situation with this hedge fund liquidation that was in 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 a lot of these names and it's all led to a pretty nasty nasty uh, downturn at the same time you were basically flat year to date. Since the end of 2018, we're up 100% since inception. We're up uh, 280%, beating the S&P 500. And I think as medium to long-term investors, we just have to swallow some of this volatility, as painful and emotionally draining as it is. We, we know, Brennan, if I could follow up here, the, the mechanics of exchange-traded funds are different than that, say, of mutual funds or separately managed accounts. We know that there's intraday price action that's happening with this KWEB ETF and all of the stocks that underlie it, most of which translates into trading that happens overseas. How exactly has your, your, your logistical infrastructure been, been perhaps taxed because of what's happening with this particular liquidation at, our, at Archegos Capital? Well, I, I think we've come through it. This is another example of where exchange-traded funds are tested by market conditions. And in, in the case of KWEB, you know, we had an exceptionally high trading day um, on Friday, 13.5 million shares, 2x, uh, the all-time highest trading volume. And we came through it uh, totally unscathed that, you know, a lot of these U.S. names uh, do have dual listings in Hong Kong that allows for pricing to take place during U.S. trading hours. And again, I think this is just another example of uh, how innovative the ETF structure is. You have 13 and a half million shares in KWEB on Friday and absolutely no issues. Now, now Tom Lydon, I'm, I'll, I'll turn to you here. We're showing a graphic right now with some of the big holdings in this KWEB ETF. From your perspective, has the ETF industry as a whole, the infrastructure, so to speak, that makes the wheels kind of turn in the ETF industry, have they really been that tested given what we've been seeing? Or is this one of those situations where this is a blip on the radar longer term and we're just going to kind of get over it in the next few weeks? Well, there have been a lot of eyes on the Chinese Chinese market, Dom, for sure. And it's held up pretty well, as Brent, Brendan said, uh, a lot of volume. On top of everything that happened last week, where it was kind of the perfect storm for Chinese stocks, we've seen that Chinese stocks have gone below major trend lines, 200-day average, 50-day average, which is going to accelerate the trading. It has not stalled or halted trading in any way. Uh, and a lot of these stocks that you point out are actually traded on U.S. exchanges as well. So, so far, everything's held up really, really well. I think some of the key things to think about as investors are long term, are these companies going to be here five and 10 years from now? And, and I'd say, yeah, there's definitely pressure between the U.S., uh, where we're going to be looking at accounting standards and making sure with the new SEC commissioner coming in that some of these companies might have to 
open up their books a little bit more and adhere to what's going on. There's also uh, scrutiny over in China, for sure, where, as you pointed out, uh, Jack Ma was kind of silenced and put on, let's let's say, double secret probation and, and uh, put on the sidelines to not talk as much as he normally does. But the bottom line is these are great companies, some of the best companies in the world, and will continue to prosper in the years to come. So, so Dave, I'll, I'll turn to you here. I mean, the idea that these ETFs can operate relatively smoothly in this kind of environment maybe speaks to some of the developments that we've seen in the ETF industry over the last several years, a lot of mistakes that have been learned from. What exactly in your mind has been the biggest kind of lesson that we've seen so far early in the stages of this liquidation tied to Archegos? Well, I think one of the key lessons here is that uh, ETFs are often where the uh, finger pointing happens. Uh, but clearly, in this case, we're not seeing it. And in fact, to, to Brendan and Tom's earlier point, uh, ETFs, particularly those focused and owning a large portion of, of the names that were, were, were owned by the fund and were, and were forced to have block sales um, have performed markedly well, even with an increasing trading volume. So uh, as ETFs have become more mainstream, they're now being used you know, as, a, as tools for both long-term investors and shorter-term investors uh, to, to get in and out of positions relatively quickly. And as we can see is that certainly we had been in a bit of a stock picker's market uh, in 2020 and maybe to some extent in the early part of 2021. Uh, but as volatility has increased across the board, especially with the confluence of the uh, political events and where valuations are, uh, especially in some of the, some of the Chinese tech names, uh, we, we certainly saw pressure uh, pretty materially. But uh, as noted, the ETFs have, again, performed really well under the face of pressure. So, so David, if, if you don't mind, I, I also your, your firm runs quite a few different strategies you have an eye on the different kinds of moves and investor sentiments and flows in and out of your funds. What can you tell us about the current state of the market right now? Where is there the most interest? Has the Chinese sell-off, has the U.S.-based media sell-off created that much of a buzz where it's now garnering all kinds more att investor attention? Or are there certain places of the market that are still kind of like the places you go to in case things do fall in value? Yeah, what's really interesting, Dom, and I, I know you know a bit about our business, so, so we have uh, ETFs that are leveraged and inverts, and they're really catered toward traders. They're intended to be really short-term um, uh, short, short exposures. What I find most interesting about the behavior is normally we see counter-cyclical behavior, meaning when uh, markets rise, actually people start betting against it, so they move into the bear funds. Conversely, if markets down, they bet on the bull funds. Most recently this year, we've continued to see uh, money in the short term move into areas that had been previous winners, like semiconductors, biotech. So we're not necessarily seeing a reversal out of those out of those areas, even though in the short term they've come off well off their highs. So we're we're keeping a close eye on this to really get a sense of investor behavior. For the time being, uh, people are are in fact doubling down on some of these uh, bets that worked really well and then have been struggling. Uh, now, certainly, we'll see how long people can uh, can hold that out. But money has been actually sticking on the kind of really high growth areas focused on you know, disruption, uh, as I said, semis and the like. Uh, that is a bit surprising to us based off of historical standards. Brendan, uh, I'd like to follow up with you here. Are, are you seeing similar type situations on your end, mostly because the Crane Shares K-Web ETF that we're talking about, we're talking about the largest Internet and computer sciences type companies, media type companies in the Chinese market. It seems to be like those are the blue chips, so to speak, if you want to find something like that. Are, are investors going back to, to buying the dip? Do you think they will buy the dip? And if so, how much transparency is needed given the current state of not knowing what's going on with Archegos and their prime brokers? Yeah, we, I mean, we've seen over this correction, Dominic, uh, uh, net inflows across our, our ETFs, including KWeb, uh, KGreen, our clean technology, CARS, our EV fund. Uh, KFBG or semiconductor. Uh, so, so I think you know, we have a lot more non-shareholders than shareholders, and you're seeing people who want to get exposure to these quality names. I mean, we're just coming out of earnings season for the KWeb companies, just simply fantastic earnings really across the board. 
Uh, you know, the Alibabas and Ten Cents get a lot of attention, but it, re- it really was across the basket that we had very, very strong uh, revenue as well as net income growth. And so I think I think you're going to see this this by the dip. I mean, I don't know how long. I mean, we would charge two and twenty if we could predict how long you're going to have this little cyclical value rebound. Uh, but I think for the medium to long term, especially where China being three quarters removed from their quarantine and these growth companies. Uh, the work from home companies are still generating these fantastic financial results. It just shows why investors should, should have exposure there. It all sounds very, very constructive and bullish. You, you know, Tom, I, I, I understand the idea of buying dips. These things are on sale and, and nothing's really changed. The corporate fundamentals are there. But there's got to be stuff that's worrying you. Are you seeing any of those trends in your role as the CEO of ETF Trends, any trends out there that we should be worried about? Are, are there things on the valuation side of things? It seems like interest rates have now taken a back seat to this discussion, given what we've seen in the last week. How much of this is going to worry the markets as long as things are kind of you know moving along these lines where we're still trying to figure out what's happening with Arcagus? Yeah, so we're still seeing record flows coming into ETF so far this year, Dom. Uh, $5.5 trillion now. But if you think about prior to COVID, it was all about the S&P 500. And with that, it was all about FANG stocks. And FANG stocks did really, really well. Fast forward to today, they've underperformed recently when you look to other innovative areas. So there's been a lot of conversation about Kathy Wood and ARC and the and high concentration in certain companies. But you look at these two firms Crane Shares, Direction, both have done a great job of picking certain areas where it's innovation. Innovation in China, for sure. We look at KBA, which are the A Shares ETF that they have over there. These are companies that you normally couldn't get three years ago, but now that you can through China. And then with Moon and over at Direction, these are the next FANG stocks that will be coming. And many of the names that you see in the portfolio, you and I wouldn't recognize. Any worries about valuations at all, Dave? I'll, I'll turn to you for this one. Any, any concern? Because many of these bets and these trading instruments that your firm puts out there are geared, like you said, towards short-term traders. Is there any notion, any feeling out there, any signals from your traders and investors that are trafficking in your funds that signals perhaps there is something to be expected with regard to volatility in the coming weeks and months? Well, I do think that uh, investors should be thinking about valuations um, much more sharply than maybe they did in the past. And the reason being is simply uh, if you're just looking at price to sales, price to earnings, whatever multiple you choose, uh, they are well above uh, historical averages. The counter argument to that is, well, interest rates remain well below historical averages. Uh, But as interest rates potentially begin to normalize on the long end, it's going to put some short-term pressure on some of these more uh, higher growth uh, disruptive names. For example, you know, some of the names in our Moonshot Innovator ETF that Tom mentioned, Moon, have seen some, some sharp underperformance over the last few weeks. Uh, that also comes on the heels of really, really sharp outperformance uh, in the previous uh, six weeks prior to that. So net-net, I think investors want to probably have more balanced portfolios toward growth and value. Uh, however, if I'm thinking about growth there – I probably want to avoid some of the FANG stocks that I've already seen their multiples increase so sharply and look at some smaller micro mid cap companies that are truly focused on disruption uh, because that there might be some more opportunities there than continuing to load up uh, on just the four to five mega cap growth companies that certainly have worked uh, and they may continue to do so, but you're not necessarily getting any diversification benefits at this point. Right. Brendan, uh, China, we mentioned earlier in the show that, you know, it's not just what's happening here in the U.S. with regard to a hedge fund possibly liquidating that's causing this. There is fundamental risk from the Chinese Communist Party with regard to how they are going to regulate those mega cap tech and media companies in China. They only have to find them a million dollars, but they get the hint How big is regulatory risk going to be for these mega cap Chinese Internet stocks in the coming months and weeks? Well, I think ultimately these companies represent everything China endeavors to be, you know, uh, companies doing innovative things, well compensated staff. They're great brand ambassadors for China. So I don't think they're going to kill the golden goose. I think these companies Yes, just as we saw in Europe, you know, in Europe in 2018 passed the GDPR, their privacy data 
uh, laws, and, and it wasn't the end of the world for the companies that operate there. Uh, so they're going to adhere, and we saw that um, you know, Tencent reported their earnings, and they said – you know, their fintech unit is adhering to the new laws, right? You know, they're not allowed to lend to college students. They can't lend more than 200000 to any individual. And they need to hold 30% of the loans that they originate. So, so I think that the companies will adhere to the new rules. Uh, some of that's out of necessity. But at the same time, the Chinese economy, which they want to be increasingly to be self-sufficient, really does need the K-Web company. So I think, I think they'll learn to play nice in the sandbox with one another, and I think they'll learn to play by these rules, and, but they still have a tremendous opportunity in front of them. Now, Tom, how, how big of a role will Chinese funds and Chinese stocks play in investor allocations in, in, in the coming year? The, the idea being here that if people want to diversify, there are places outside the U.S. that maybe have a higher growth profile, even than what we have here. Is China that, I mean, I hesitate to call it an emerging market because it's the world's second biggest economy at this point. But are there other markets out there besides China on the outside of the U.S. side of things that are, that are going to become magnets for investment capital? Yeah, well, uh, emerging markets uh, have been real strong lately, Dom, as you know. But you can't help but concentrate on China. Uh, it's just so dominant and going forward will continue to be dominant. Uh, you know, as these guys are saying, there's so much innovation that's going on there, and they're not going to, the government is not going to shoot themselves in the foot. They are promoting innovation in a big, big way. These companies have real earnings, and it's not 1999. The, there's not huge, huge, expensive stocks that are making up these portfolios today, and I think that's something to think about. All good companies over time have corrections. You know Amazon corrected 90% three different times over the course of its history. We just have to expect that and maybe look at those as buying opportunities.